Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Where community does matter, especially in an election year, it really matters a lot, so pay attention. Especially to all those other programs. I'm just the energy guy. What I'd like to do today, before we get with our guests, is talk a little bit about what my organization, HCAT, is, where it is, what it does, just so you can get a feel for, as we go into this discussion with our guests, where I'm coming from in terms of microgrids and things. HCAT is uh, actually a small program, only five of us in the office, we're down to four right now, we're looking for a secretary if anybody's interested. But uh, only five of us and we manage contracts for the Air Force Research Lab and we do a lot of demonstration projects for the Air Force in not only hydrogen fuel cell vehicles but also microgrids. And right now, um, it it's kind of confuses people. We're, we're part of DBED, we're part of Department of Business, Economic Development and, and Tourism for the state and we're a program, but we're totally federally funded. We're, we don't take any tax revenues from the state at all um, and we're federally funded 100% by the Air Force to do our projects. But the good news is all the cool stuff I learn working with the Air Force on hydrogen vehicles and microgrids, I get to bring back to the state of Hawaii and share it with HECO and share it with Hawaii Gas and share it with other people, uh, community developers, um, local business development councils, um, Chamber of Commerce, um, Hawaii, uh, Blue Planet Hawaii, Blue Planet Research, University of Hawaii, we all share together uh, to try and make Hawaii a better place in terms of renewable energy. And it's amazing how much synergy we get in that group with non-for-profits and other folks, uh, commercial folks, on where we're trying to get to in Hawaii with clean energy. So our microgrid out at Hickam is kind of unique in that it's, it's focused on one part of Hickam Air Force Base or Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam with the Hawaii Air National Guard. They have a, a, what we call a fighter campus with fifth generation F-22 fighters, top of the line Air Force fighters. But it's in a small area and it just is perfectly located along their grid where we actually have two redundant lines so we can actually pull that campus off the main grid and put it back on fairly easily. And we're developing a series of microgrids out there that will show the Air Force they can take all renewable energy and provide energy to their military mission even if their commercial power goes down. And at first we can cover all the power requirements at that campus, but over a week or two weeks or three weeks or a month or two months or six months, all of a sudden if you don't have enough power there, you're, you're kind of hurting. And we're going to show that even when you get to a real austere time, like cloudy days and rainy days and not much sunlight to get your power on, we can keep the critical missions on that base going no matter what, indefinitely, 24 hours, 7 days a week, 365 a year. And that's what we're showing to the Air Force. HECO is kind of watching us, other utilities are watching us, other services are watching us. But that's what we're trying to show for the state of Hawaii and the Air Force, that it can be done. Why is that important? If you get more than 20%-ish of re intermittent renewables on any grid, the utility has a really, really hard time balancing all that load. So all the things that we've learned about what a utility can absorb, what it can absorb, how much has to be base power, base load power, and what can be intermittent, it's really important. And a lot of people I've, I've talked to say, oh, the electric companies just make it a big story about how hard it is. And I go, no, it's, it's really, really hard to balance a grid when you have that much intermittent renewable on it. But there's, there's solutions. And we're trying to help everybody see those solutions in Hawaii and outside Hawaii. We work with Europe and Asia and everybody else. Now, the State Energy Office, they're also in DBED, but they're policy people. They help the governor do policy things. We actually have our hands in the, in the cake, so to speak, and we actually build things and help design things or put the contracts out to design things that have to do with grids and hydrogen. So a little bit of background there. And to that, my guest today is Michael Markrich from Granite Power, and he's here to talk with me a little bit about some of the things that we've talked about offline uh, in other forums about what Hawaii could be doing with grid power 
and with hydrogen and what the future looks like. So, Michael, thanks for being on the oh, show with us. My pleasure. Thank you for asking glad, me. I'm glad you're here today. And we do have a lot of conversations at lunch and stuff about this. And so tell folks a little bit about yourself and, and what you do um, with Granite Power and what you do in the community with like Renew Rebuild Hawaii. So by training, I'm an economist. And for the last 10 years or so, I've been working in different aspects of renewable energy. And uh, one of my companies that I've been working with is Granite Power, which is an Australian-based company. And they do have an organic Rankin cycle uh, engine, which is, a, which is a 19th century way of describing a way to uh, use low energy heat to make power. Mm -hmm. And uh, the purpose of this you know, is that uh, whenever the, you have uh, an engine that's producing power, there's always waste heat. Right. And there's a lot of waste heat. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, we live with that waste heat as our We throw it away. We throw it away. Yeah. And what they did was they developed a system and said, well, let's use this waste heat. Let's, you know, and off a, off a typical diesel engine, you know, they could mm -hmm. get another 10 percent. Right. So uh, why not use that 10 percent? And, and then, you know, on a, on a, on a, a big, uh, let's say a big 10 megawatt system, you get, you get a megawatt, which maybe that's 200 homes. You yeah. know, that's, that's uh, you could be powering. Right. And, and that's all paid for. Right. right. Uh, so uh, we, we've been, they have a, a, a project in uh, the Republic of Samoa right now, and uh, we're using waste heat and uh, several other uh, projects in Australia, and then we've been, you know, talking to different uh, people and different clients in, in Hawaii about doing projects here. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities here, um, and this is like, uh, you know, when now you know, everybody's really into cooking and using, you know, every part of the every right. part of the cow, every part of the pig, you know, and um, using all the vegetables we used to throw away. But why, why throw away energy? Yeah, you know, exactly. why not use every bit of energy? Right. And you know, we, we, we have our you know changing light bulbs and these other things we're doing, and you know, this is another way. This is saying, look, heat, heat's around us. Why don't we use that heat uh, and and make more power out of it? Yeah. The first law of thermodynamics is that energy is neither made nor lost. It just changes. That's right. Changes form. So, it's either heat or it's radiant energy or it's electricity That's or right. it's uh, potential energy. Uh, you know, wave action energy. I mean, you, you can have kinetic energy. There's, it just changes from one to another. So heat's just another form of energy that could be turned maybe into electricity if you do it right. And that's what granite power apparently does. That's right, exactly. Do they also do geothermal down in Australia? Because you know, the, the, that whole area of the, of the Pacific is on that ring of fire. They're very interested in geothermal. The, the reason they haven't been doing it in Australia um, is because in Australia you have to go down very deep right. to get to geothermal, it's, although it's there. So New Zealand next door might have yeah, the Yeah, yeah. and, okay. and uh, um, Hawaii is very attractive for geothermal. That's a, lot, you know, a lot of people around the world look to Hawaii as a leader of geothermal. Mm -hmm. um, even though right now uh, our, our geothermal um, biggest plant is not working, but, right, because but, of the volcano but, being but, active. but for the last 22 years, yeah. uh, Hawaii's been a world leader in geothermal. In the past 22 years, though, technology has changed quite a bit. So the geothermal that we have on the big island at Pune Geothermal is not what you'd call cutting edge technology in the geothermal world. And, and I think that's actually a good topic for discussion today. You know, a lot of, I know in the hydrogen world, technology's changed rapidly mm -hmm. and, and really advanced. Mm -hmm. And I've actually seen some geothermal companies that have very small footprints, very safe systems, and potentially could be doing some, some work here without the fear factor that, you know, seems to pop up whenever Pune Geothermal's name comes up in the media or something where people are concerned about safety issues and things in their, in their area. Um, so along those lines, the reason Pune Geothermal is down right now is because of the active volcano, the lava is right in their backyard, literally. Um, in fact, it's kind of funny that the lava creeped right up to their boundary line and a little over and then stopped. Um, I don't know if it's still moving that way, but um, it's like is somebody sending a message. I mean, like, is, is um, Madame Pelle upset with everybody else, but she's okay with Pune Geothermal? I don't know. Maybe that's a, an indicator. But certainly, the amount of energy coming out of that, that lava is an exceptionally huge amount of energy that maybe we should be tapping into and maybe we could be using on the Big Island. Um, are, have you done any research to see, like on the Big Island particularly, where there's some other hot spots in the, in the area? Well, actually, you know, there's, there's a number of, of different places. And uh, 
the, the closer you are to, to, to where the lava is flowing, uh, right, that's right. the better. That's in terms that's, 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 that, that, that's where yeah. you want to be. Um, uh, so, so there, there are uh, more opportunities. You know, the, the question is, you know, is it something that the public there wants right, to accept, right. you know, wants to embrace? Um, you know, the, the alternative to not embracing that is, of course, for base power, you still need fossil fuels. Right. So, so, you know, I, I get these, in, in some ways, these are all, to certain people, these are all bad choices. You know, right. either, you know, fossil fuels is a bad choice because it, it overheats our atmosphere. Uh, you know, uh, maybe for uh, religious or cultural reasons, uh, you know, uh, geothermal's bad. But you're, you're always having to weigh what, in, in this right. modern world, you know, what is your best alternative? Right. Yeah, and my understanding is that Pune Geothermal actually provides between 20 and 30 percent of the Big Island's energy. At least 31 percent. 31 percent. Up, up until, what was that, two months? Until they shut down. That's right, yeah. Um, and the shutdown is precautionary. I mean, they might be able to still operate, but I know that they don't want to be in a, risk, in a risky situation, so they, they're just shut down now. But 31% um, is a lot because that's base load power. That's not intermittent that's renewable. Right. So the electric company looks at that as stable power that they can use, that they know how much is coming in all the time. They can count on it 24 hours a day, not interrupted, mm -hmm. and they can, they can count on that. So um, when you have that kind of base power, along with the Big Island also has rivers and waterfalls, a lot of them, mm -hmm. and they have a lot of, of hydroelectric power, which the other islands, really, we really don't capture that um, as much. I don't know how much we could capture, but when you look at the state's electricity requirements, the neighbor islands are already well ahead of, of this island, yeah, Oahu, yeah. on the renewable energy because they have access to more wind power, more solar power, and those baseload powers like geothermal and hydroelectric. So even though Hawaiian Electric here on Oahu is struggling with 20, 25% intermittent renewables, um, the neighbor islands have that 20, 25% and 50% of other renewables right. that aren't intermittent. So they're over 50% for the most part. And when it comes to meeting that deadline to be 100% renewable by 2045 that we have here in the state, the neighbor islands are gonna be there in a, in a hurry. Yeah. It's just how are you gonna get Oahu up to that level? We don't have enough room for all the solar. We don't have enough room and, or a desire to put windmills. I mean, I had um, Senator uh, Rivieri on, on the show here a, a few months ago, and his constituents are like, you know, we, we thought the wind power wouldn't be bad, but right now they're, they're pretty much up to their ears and like, we're done with wind. It's, it's not really what we expected. And um, I think it'd be a hard sell to put as much wind up there as we really need to bring power to Oahu. So. It's, it's almost like we have to look at the neighbor islands to help with the energy on this island. And how do we do it with the cultural piece and everything else? Because it's not just, are we gonna upset Madame Pele? It's, why am I making energy for you? What am I getting out of it? Why is the big island gonna put up with a, a big geothermal plant? Or, or is Maui gonna put up with a bunch more windmills and, and, and kind of have that in their backyard just so the power can come to Oahu? And that's the kind of things we need to address in the state and make sure that you're, you're right. It's, it's like, has everybody weighing it out? Is, is we weighing our options and making the right choice? So do you have any insight on, on maybe how we should be looking at that or? Well, you know, I, I, I look at, say, what happened in, in Japan when uh, all of a sudden we had this terrible tragedy with Fukushima. And, right. And then, you know, Japanese, they, they shut down those plants, of course. But the they power still plant, power. nuclear power plants. So then they, they turned actually to geothermal, which was at Tohoku, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and and so, you know, uh, the lesson there is that when, I think one needs to be flexible, one needs to look at these different uh, right. costs and benefits and, and opportunities. And um, you, you look at, for example, Iceland, which uses geothermal. Been there a bunch of times in the military. Yeah, yeah and, and uh, uh, they've been able to make peace with geothermal. I think uh, geothermal here uh, grew out of kind of a you know very kind of wild west kind of thing. People were experimenting yeah, yeah. and trying new things, and and you know the, there there was a public cost to that. Yeah, um, and they're kind of in a residential area almost. It's it's it's. It's a populated area, and that's the wrong and, place to do this kind of and, yeah, that's right. ex and, almost experimental work. We're going to take a quick break here, and we'll be right back uh, to talk more with Mr. Markrich on Big Island, hydrogen, geothermal, power, all those good things.
Aloha and Richard Conception, the host of Hispanic Hawaii. You can watch my show every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. We will bring you entertainment, educational, and also we tell you what is happening right here within our community. Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Gabrielli. I'm the host for Young Talents Making Way here on FinTech Hawaii. We talk every Tuesday at 11 a.m. about things that matter to tech, matter to science, uh, to the people of Hawaii with some extraordinary guests, the students uh, of our schools who are participating in science fair. So Young Talents Making Way every Tuesday at 11 a.m. only on FinTech Hawaii. Mahalo. Hey, hello, and welcome back to Stand Energy Man with Michael Markrich from Granite Power. On my lunch hour, if I hadn't mentioned that before, thanks for being here with us. Well, we're talking about the Big Island, and we're talking about some of the energy uh, on the Big Island, particularly geothermal, um, which is a hot topic, no pun intended, right now, because, uh, you know, it is, with new technology, a really safe option. As you just mentioned, in Japan, they had a lot of nuclear power. Um, and it turns out, in the, in, and it was March 11th of 2011 that they had the earthquake and tsunami. I remember that because that's my birthday. And I, I remember really yeah, clearly yeah. sitting there watching TV yeah. and seeing a tsunami roll in on the, on the news. And, and the, even the media didn't know what was happening. And I go, that's a tsunami. And, but it was just a big surge of water moving into a harbor. And they didn't, they didn't get it. But that's, that disaster um, really woke people up to as safe as you think nuclear power is, um, and as cheap as it can be, there's still a big cost to it when things don't go right. And um, like you mentioned earlier, um, in Hawaii, if we're, if we're gonna make choices, let's make the right choices. So um, I personally look at the Big Island, and if we do hydrogen and geothermal properly, um, get buy-in from the community, hopefully make some great, not just jobs, but great careers, and maybe great communities yeah. as part of the project, um, it actually could be a really good choice on the Big Island. What, what do you think? So I, I, I wish there was a way that we could uh, communicate with people in Iceland who have this very You're similar right. conditions and, and invite people from Iceland to come to Hawaii and mm -hmm. perhaps, you know, uh, send people from the Big Island to visit Iceland just mm -hmm. to get that other perspective. Um, and this is, again, being sensitive to the cultural right. piece of this, the cultural uh, sensitivities, uh, just to think, okay, well, where are we going to be in 20 years? Where, are, where is the world going to be in 30 years? You know, what are our children going to experience? What are our grandchildren going to experience as, as, as the world you know, keeps heating up? And it keeps heating up because of fossil fuels. Right. Because we still do need, for base power at this point, significant amounts of fossil fuels. Right. And, you know, what if we could, what if we could use less fossil fuels? What if we had other options? What if we had, for example, hydrogen, mm -hmm. which we could make from... And you know, store energy storage. in that. That's right, geothermal. Yeah. And, and so uh, I, I, I think that we, we need to, to look at, at the fact that we're all interconnected now. Yep. And you know, you know Iceland is far, far away from here, but, but actually it's not that far, you know? Yeah. You know, I, it's the old butterfly in China flapping his wings is connected to the tornado in Kansas routine. It, yeah. We are connected, and people don't appreciate it. Um, I'm fortunate that I've actually been to Iceland probably five or six times as part of my military life, and you're right. It's really incredible. And talk about um, excess heat energy to use. They've got more heat than, than they know what to do with, and the whole island, and they're up near, I mean, part of, the, of, of Iceland is in the Arctic Circle. Mm -hmm. They use all the heat for heating all their buildings and making all their electricity and making the power for all their transportation, their public transportation. And you're right, it's it's pretty remarkable that they have a very small fossil fuel put footprint um, and most of that's confined to fishing boats and things where they, they have to, that hasn't been perfected yet, uh, electric transportation on the boats. but. You know, you're right. It's a it's a great example, but and, and what did they do with that money? You know, like like what yeah. they did was they they developed uh, high tech industries. Yeah. You know, they they you know they they, they had a kind of a disastrous in, uh, experience with with uh, banking, but but other industries came right. and they developed tourism. There were so many different things that they did. Well, as an econ economist, and I've asked this of several big economists here, including our own in Dbed, what would be the the implications of taking Hawaii from an energy importing state? 
to either an energy neutral state or, oh my gosh, an energy exporting state. If we could make liquid hydrogen off of um, the geothermal on the Big Island, supply all the needs in the whole state, and the Big Island could actually export to the mainland or to Korea or Japan or China or, and be selling energy out to another country. What would the implications be economically to our state? So I, I like to, to go back in time and okay. say that uh, Hawaii uh, already has been a huge energy exporter through the sugar industry. Right, you know, cause exactly. We, what, what, is, what is sugar but And whale, energy. for that matter. Uh, right, right, uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and and, and we, we, uh, we were the world's leader in sugar for, mm -hmm. for 50 years, you know, maybe. Uh, and uh, people thought sugar would last forever. That's and, right. you know, sugar brought so much wealth into Hawaii, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sugar was, you know, uh, maybe the reason that of, of all the United States territories, Hawaii became most developed. Hawaii was the one mm -hmm. of all the territories that was and Alaska became a state, but it was because of this enormous wealth that right. came from sugar that made Hawaii so valuable. So if you think, okay, well, if we have something else that we can export that is extremely valuable, mm -hmm. yes, uh, I think that you're right. Mm -hmm. Ho Hawaii would then uh, become, once again, a very wealthy state. And right now, we, we, we're, we're a wealthy state from the standpoint of we have tourism, we have things, but, but the, uh, the problem is that, that all of this activity is concentrated in fairly a small percent of the, right. of the land area and the population. And as a result of this, we have great degree of income inequality mm -hmm. that, that people suffer from in Hawaii. And uh, we've become very crowded and, and life- And expensive. And expensive. Yeah. And, and for many people, I think life has become less pleasant here than yeah. it was. People who can remember even 20 years mm -hmm. ago how that life was very different. Mm -hmm. But what, what if we were to say, okay, well, maybe there's a different way of doing this. And, and if you look at Hawaii's history and you see like every 50 years, there's been a dramatic change, you know. Well, you know, at, at first, you know, it was uh, provisioning ships, and then it was the whales, mm -hmm. and then it was sugar, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and then it was tourism. Mm -hmm. And each time, people thought, "Oh, this is just going to last forever," right. right? But then it didn't. Something else came along, right. and maybe the next thing is ready to come along. Yeah. So here's my vision that I see: if 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 I could maybe wave my magic hydrogen wand is that we find the right place on the Big Island to do geothermal safely and properly with all the cultural considerations, all of the buy-in from the community, give them their piece of the pie up front, their halal, their canoe hale, their, their community, their housing, their jobs, as the, as the equipment's going in to be built in a safe, clean, good environment, and then we start at scale producing liquid hydrogen, using it to balance the grid throughout the state, maybe even on Maui, That's right. when instead of them putting more windmills up, um, help export some hydrogen power over to Maui and put it in their system with electrolysis on Big Island, making clean hydrogen from, from uh, renewable geothermal, exporting that liquid hydrogen to Maui and Oahu and maybe even Kauai if they need it to run their grids and their transportation sector, by the way, because hydrogen, we've already got the Toyota Mirai here and their Serco opened their station. Hydrogen transportation is electric transportation. It's just a, a different kind of battery. And we're trying to electrify our, our transportation sector. And oh, by the way, if it makes sense and if the community can take it, go up to exporting hydrogen to the mainland or, or Asia, and maybe even start looking at space travel. Because as you and I have talked before, um, the state is looking at, at a spaceport on the Big Island because of the geographic location of Hawaii close to the equator. There's a natural tendency um, to do that. The lunar uh, astronauts trained in Haleakala. Um, there's a Mars habitat on the Big Island right now. Um, Blue Planet Research supports that operation under contract from NASA. There's The Big Island is poised to be that future looking outer space exploring part of the US that probably no other place can be. And the hydrogen is right there to support liquid rockets and things right. like that. You know, I, I think that's really, really interesting uh, because if you look, you know, what are, what are the demands for, for space travel right now? It's because uh, uh, that pharmaceutical companies want to do research in and, space, in space yeah. because the costs are so much lower. I mean, mm -hmm. I think the, 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 the number one uh, 
most profitable industry in the United States is the pharmaceutical industry. Right? Mm -hmm. So people don't realize that you know how much, how many uh, experiments are now being done in space on new drugs, and right. because you know you can hold things out of solution. Mm -hmm. There's less gravity. There's all the kinds of advantages. It's it's much less expensive, even with all of the, of the expense of sending rockets into space with with your experiment. The risk and, yeah. and it's it's less expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other is the the, the uh, enormous and unsatisfied yet demand for high-speed data transmission, right? Right. That's also, I mean, it's that's a tremendous need. And so that, that's another thing that, you know, if Hawaii was, had, you know, had a space launch program on the Big Island and we, we had the hydrogen there to power the rockets, um, we could start sending rockets into space commercially and satisfying that market. Mm -hmm. It can employ hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people, and it could be the new industry for Hawaii. Yeah. Well, right now it's you and me dreaming, buddy, but I think we can get there. And I, I think there's a lot of support from the community, um, and not just the Oahu community, but neighbor island communities. I think there's uh, actually a fair amount of support from the legislature. Talked to a fair number of them, and, and they're really supportive. They're looking for they know that Hawaii's economy is at a tipping point right now and ready for that every 50 year transition. Um, and they've got to do something to help boost our economy. We're only a pen stroke away from losing all the army at Schofield or, or the military will always have a footprint here, I'm convinced. But just losing a bunch of troops at Schofield could have a devastating effect on our economy overall or losing any of the ships in the in shipyard or losing the shipyard, but losing ships in Pearl Harbor. That could happen at the stroke of a pen from the DOD. And then our tourism industry, you know, although we think it's pretty stable, just the volcanic activity misunderstood by people, they stopped coming. Uh, even when 9-11 happened, a lot of tourists didn't want to come because they felt it was imposing during a crushing time for our country mm. and tourism took a big hit then. Um, yeah, oh, that's true. And uh, I, I was going to say that uh, getting back to space, I mean, we, we, we say, okay, well, um, People, this is a big dream, but I mean, uh, people with lots and lots of resources, more resources than you and I, uh, you know, yeah. like uh, um, Amazon. Elon big, Musk. Elon Musk. Yeah. You know, they're all developing uh, space capabilities. They wouldn't be doing this if they didn't think That's there was right. a market there. Yeah. There's, there's, yeah and uh, I was reading about uh, New Mexico, for example, now has a space office because they want to start luring yeah. uh, uh, companies to do space research and space launching from New Mexico. Yeah. So, so that's another that's another competitor of ours. Yeah. So people are already thinking in those terms. So we should be too. Well, we'll have you back on the show so we can talk about the space force that President Trump talked about and see when that happens because I know that would have an impact on you know, hopefully, um, if we get into space over here, you know, the potential for, for doing those operations, or some of them out of here, at least monitoring those things. So well, we'll have to get you back on and update that. But we're about out of time on Stanley Energy Man this week. And Michael, I'd like to thank you again for being on the show. Oh, thank you. And we definitely have to have you back to talk more space stuff. But yeah, everybody out there, if you have any comments or, or concerns about um, the topic today, hey, we'd really like to hear from you. So send a a tweet or a, a message to the studio here and they'll pass it on to me. I was going to just say one thing. Yeah. I think the space industry now is $280 billion and people are saying that it's going to be soon a $30 trillion industry. Wow. So. Okay. Well, there you go. Right from the economist's mouth. Um, there's a lot of potential there. So give us your thoughts and uh, the Stanley Energy Man signing off until next week, Friday. Aloha. <laughs>